Tonight we're doing a debut experience of Books and Brews. We have two authors here tonight, which means I had to read two books in a very short amount of time, <laughs> but they were phenomenal. So let me go and introduce our authors we have here tonight. Lucy Bryan, who is a, that's a you're already getting cheers. Listen to all these things. Writer, mother, adventurer, teacher, and lover of alpenglow, fungi, tiny streams, tall trees, native wildflowers, campfires, homegrown vegetables, thunderstorms, and tents. My kind of person. <laughs> uh, she splits her time between Ohio's Appalachian Plateau and Virginia Shenandoah Valley, where she's a faculty member at James Madison University's Writing Center. Her award-winning essays have been nominated for the Pushcart Prize and listed as notable in Best American Essays. But she's here tonight to talk about her first book, uh, which came out in June 2022 from Homebound Publications. In Between Places, you can see it above me, um, the memoir, an, a memoir in essays. Let's welcome Lucy. You can take a seat. You can sit down, Lucy. <laughs> you all can sit down and be relaxed and drink your water and your beer. Also joining us tonight is a returning Books and Brews author. I had the pleasure of interviewing Sophia Samatar on February 14th of like 2018. Monster portraits. For any of you all who were here, we did Monsters on Valentine's. Wonderful. Sophia is author of five books. Her first novel, the epic fantasy, A Stranger in Olandria, won the 2014 William L. Crawford Fantasy Award, the British Fantasy Award, and the World Fantasy Award for Best Novel, and was included in Time Magazine's list of the 100 best fantasy books of all time. That deserves a round. She also received the 2014, thank you, our pets, astounding award for the best new writer. Her genre-bending book, which I agree, Monster Portraits, was a collaboration with her brother, the artist Del Samatar, was also a finalist for the Calvino Prize. Sophia lives here in Harrisonburg and teaches African literature, Arabic literature, and speculative fiction at James Madison University. She's here tonight to talk about her most recent book, published by Penguin Random House in October, The White Mosque. Thank you, Sophia, for holding it up. A memoir which tells the story of her trip to Uzbekistan to research a group of Mennonites who followed a charismatic preacher to Central Asia in the 19th century. So let's give Sophia and Lucy both a warm welcome. And now I get to sit. <laughs> you can see we're going to have a lot to talk about tonight. But we're going to start with really kind of a definition. I like definitions. A simple definition of a memoir. It's a narrative written from perspective of the author about an important part of their life. So with that simple definition, I just thought, you all stepped into some new spaces, I think, in memoir. I think it, it expanded a little further than that. I just wanted to, to see if you can tell us what led you to write these books and cho choice of memoir. And you can choose who speaks first. I guess me. First of all, again, hello, everybody, and thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. It's great to spend time with you and to be back in person at Books and Brews. Really amazing. Um, so I wrote, I became sort of obsessed with this story of these Mennonites that traveled to Central Asia. And um, I was um, and still am a speculative fiction writer. So I'm very interested in fantasy. I'm interested in strange stories, um, surprising stories. And this was a story that actually happened. And yet it, it 
kind of hit me almost as if it were a fantastical narrative um, of these people who followed a very charismatic preacher who told them that Christ was returning to meet them in Central Asia on March 8, 1889. He had it down to a date, a very specific date. And um, I, I started researching it really because um, beyond the strangeness, it, it seemed to raise really interesting questions and ideas for me about what do you do when your world has collapsed? So that was, I mean, along the way, there are many other things I got interested in. But first, this idea of what do you do? And what they did was stay there and have a Mennonite village in the middle of Muslim Central Asia that existed for 50 years. And that was, um, there's something compelling to me about that, that notion of overcoming or of having a huge disappointment. Um, and then you, you make something out of what's left. So what does that cover in your life? Well, in my life, the thing about the story that stood out to me was that it is a, an early moment of Mennonite-Muslim interaction. And I come from a family that is Mennonite on one side and Muslim on the other. So when I heard about this story of this, um, you know, these people making a life um, in a culture that was not their own, surrounded by people of a faith that was not their own, and making it work, that um, I just wanted to find out more about that. I wanted to know, well, what was that like? How does that happen? How did they live um, in between these different cultures and, and systems? Lucy. OK. Um, when I started writing this book, I actually did not realize I was writing a book. Um, it, is, it is a memoir and essays, um, so there are these little bits and pieces that I wrote that came together eventually. But I, I started writing um, in a, a difficult time in my life. My, my first husband had left me. Um, I, my dad had died of prostate cancer. Um, my um, faith that I'd had for much of my life was sort of um, supplanted by doubt, and I um, didn't really know who I was. So I started spending a lot of time outside, um, hiking, backpacking, and I also started spending a lot of time writing, just trying to figure out um, who am I? How do I? How do I move forward? Who do I want to be? And so um, I published the first essay in this collection. I think in um, 2012 or 2013, and um, just continue writing over a series of years. And um, the the collection sort of evolves and follows me on this journey of um, of healing of. Um, meeting my current husband and falling in love again, of having my first child. Um, but most of the essays are set in um, wilderness and, and places out, outdoors that allowed me the space to explore what was going on in my life. Um, the natural history, the human history of those places really spoke to me and um, gave me um, a way forward, and so um, it's very much a conversation between my life and those places as well. Do you feel like, not knowing that it was going to be a book, that it took more courage to put this together, or at the time it was part of just the process? I think it was part of the process. I just, like, for me, writing was a way to, I think, um, you know, so much of what happened to me in that time period was outside of my control. Um, I, I didn't choose for my marriage to end. I didn't choose for my dad to die. Um, but writing, I could be the author of my own story. Um, and so it was a way to... Yeah, to feel, I think, some control in a situation that felt very out of control. Um, and um, so it's what I felt like I just needed to do to survive. And then the fact that I was then able to publish some of these pieces and, and they resonated with people and people liked reading them, that was, that was also really wonderful. And it was probably about halfway through the collection when I started to realize, like, ah, there's kind of a thing going on where it's like I go outside and I have some realizations and maybe these things like kind of fit together so um, I, I realized I had a book in the making and then was able to keep doing that 
And for you, Sophia, you've had five other novels, pieces that you've written, um, genre-breaking pieces, and, and the fantasy memoir. Was that hard for you to step into, to share your personal story? It was. It was, well, I mean, every book that I write feels like I've never written a book before. So it's, you know, it's not that, you know, memoir made it so much more, but it definitely had, um, it was a different experience. And in fact, when I first started writing it, the first thing I wrote was a fiction piece. And I, um, I imagined that I was this woman who had gone on this journey to Central Asia. And, you know, I kind of did a lot of reading about the history and, and um, kind of read some memoirs from the period and from the place. In fact, a lot of that material gets into the White Mosque in terms of me quoting memoirs of people who were on this journey and who remember what it was like. So using those, I wrote this fiction piece. But by the time I um, you know, got to the end of, of writing the book, which took a long time, it was a seven year project because there was a lot of research. And of course, there was a trip to Uzbekistan that I took, which, um, which followed the journey of these folks. So all of that took a lot of time. But by the time I got around to the end of it, I, I thought it really doesn't need this fiction. That was my, it was almost like a crutch for me because it was familiar and it was something that I knew. But like, this story is wild. You don't have to make this story into anything. You know, it's, you don't have to make things up no. when you have a story that is, that is this startling. Yeah. It, it is a wild story, and it definitely is one that I was not familiar with in terms of the history of, and is that a common story, that, that the Mennonite history that you, you were aware of when you were a kid? No, I went to a Mennonite high school and a Mennonite college. And when I found out about this story, I was like, what? <laughs> and many Mennonites that I talk to now are also like, what? Central Asia? And part of the reason for that is that for a long time, there was a lot of shame around this story. Because these people, you know, they really believed that Christ was returning to meet them and it didn't happen and they were seen by others you know and many of them you know after this disappointment they did leave Central Asia and they came and settled in the US and Canada where a lot of other Mennonites were settling at the time they had started off in southern Russia what's now Ukraine um, and they were ashamed of this story because it was like they'd been tricked you know and they had been they had been so gullible and they had fallen into this heresy of believing you know what this guy was was saying um, and it's really Really, only in the 21st century that among, you know, in Mennonite circles, people are starting to revisit this story and say, now hang on now, there's more to this story than just people who were led astray. This is a story about a really powerful cross cultural engagement. And many of the people, in fact, yeah, several of the people who were on the trip with me. Um, were descendants of these folks. And it was very moving and very powerful for them to s go to Uzbekistan to see the interest that people in Uzbekistan have in this story and to, to realize for themselves that there are things to appreciate about it um, and, and that it's not just something that should be kind of buried and, and forgotten. Not a shameful yeah. collapse, so to speak. Well, you both, in your titles, you know, convey that sense of exploring very directly in between places. Um, I guess, what is the specific in-betweenness of, of your experiences? Yours, the, the White Mosque, is really a Mennonite church in a Muslim community, <laughs> you know, the, that's that's an in-betweenness. That's a a, 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 cult, a crossroads. So really, what were the things that you experienced um, in that? In, what was your in-betweenness in this? Lucy, you want to start? Sure, I'll start. Um, well, there's a lot of in-betweenness in this book. Um, the title comes from one of the essays in the book in which um, my I take my brother, I think I was around 31, and my, my brother's 12 years younger than me, so he was 19. And this was um, a, a 
year or two after our father had passed away, and I took him backpacking in Dali Sad's wilderness, which is just north of here. Um, and um, we both were in these times of transition. I had just moved to um, Harrisonburg. Um, I was um, engaged to be married again. Um, he was transitioning into college and trying to figure out his life, and we were both just trying to figure out what does it mean to live life without our dad. Um, and um, I had started meditating at the time to start dealing with just some of m my anxieties. And so, um, you know, that that essay is about you know, coming to terms with being in that middle place. But there are other essays in the book, um, really the whole book that examines this this theme. Um, and so, you know, I, I look at um, what it is like to be someone who um, is not sure whether she believes in God, but also likes to go to church and is open to the existence of the divine. And so I'm not really, I'm not an atheist, I'm not really an agnostic, I'm, I'm a quester, I'm, so, I'm something in between. Um, what is it like to, um, you know, geographically be in between places? So my um, my husband grew up in a small intentional community in rural Ohio, and um, since we uh, moved here in 2014, we've been spending um, summers, winter breaks, and then also pandemic and maternity leaves up in Ohio. And we go back and forth um, between Ohio and um, Virginia. And, um, you know, haven't quite really been able to put down roots in either places. So just that experience of moving physically in between places um, is something I explore. And so, um, you know, I, I say in one of the essays that something I've sort of come to accept is that like the middle, um, which we often see as like, you know, okay, you're trying to get from point A to point B or like, figure yourself out, go one way or the other, you know, but the middle is, it's not a void. Um, it's this like really rich, fruitful, interesting place. And so um, this book I think is um, not about getting from one place to the other, but learning to dwell in, um, in that in-between place and to be okay with it. Not always comfortable though, is it? No. <laughs> <laughs> How about you? Um, that, that, sense of feeling in between culture and religions and space. Yep, and, <laughs> and race, right? Like mixed race, mixed, you know, mixed cultural background. Um, and and the, because the book um, is set on this trip to Uzbekistan, also, you know, in the middle between Asia and Europe, so there's so and we're we're a lot of this journey was taking us on the on the old Silk Road, you know. So a place of like you said, incredible richness and diversity in this middle place with all of these different cultures, languages. I mean, it's in, and it's an incredible breadbasket in terms of like you know cherries, plums, beach, like so many different things that that. Um, that happen in this very rich kind of in between place that is that is in between in so many ways. Yeah, that is. I mean, I think that's a really um, a theme between the two books. There is, in fact, an, in about the middle of the book, there is this, you know, kind of like halfway, you know, a section called halfway, and I'm in. I think it was when we were in Bukhara and eating a Rice Krispie treat that was <laughs> stuffed with dried fruit in the Central Asian manner. And I was like, there you go. It was like, that, that was the dessert. It was very, yeah, symbolic of the space. And if I can just add one more thing to that, it occurred to me there is a word in biology, and I, I reference it in my book, that describes this. It's called an ecotone. Um, and an ecotone is a place where two ecosystems um, intersect and you have this this space that has the sort of biological diversity of both of those ecosystems this overlap um, and I think that's you know illustrative of, of you know um, the spiritual and psychological territories that we also have when we're in the middle now she mentioned the rice crispy so I have to say you need to speak about what you ate in Ohio, 
because I just wanted to make sure that that was okay. <laughs> yeah, there, there is a maybe ick factor um, in one of my essays. Um, so uh, during the last uh, 17 years, cicada hatch, my, my in-laws were like, yeah, bugs, let's eat them. Um, and you know, my, my father-in-law came in and he fired up the skillet and my four-year-old niece was carrying a bowl full of live cicadas and they just popped them in, put a lid on them and then started eating them. And, and I, I, I had to eat one, I was compelled to eat one, but I only ate one. <laughs> So it wasn't it wasn't that good. You didn't. I mean, you're not hooked. You know, it was fine. I would say it was sort of like kind of like between popcorn and potato chip and a little nutty. I mean, it wasn't actually bad tasting. I just like psychologically could not get over the like idea of like bugs and wings and crunching in my mouth and you know, I, I wouldn't do well on Fear Factor. I don't think. I grew up in Iowa. We never ate any cicadas. <laughs> So I was shocked. Um, you're, both y'all's books, again, another theme, and I'm going to use their words because I hope we get a chance to hear, and we will, hopefully, a, a, a bit of them reading tonight. The words are beautiful. And as I said to Sophia, they asked themselves so many questions throughout this book that it made my job kind of easy. But using some of your words, you're both on journeys, um, pilgrimages, to be specific, in your case, and hiking all over the place, um, in different places, Lucy. And you know, from Black, was it Blackbird Knob Trail, Cumberland um, Island, and then work with the Nature Conservancy in Florida, um, just trying to get to you know. Did you feel like, how does that land or those places really form a pilgrimage, or did they form a pilgrimage for you? And, and how did, and you could even just choose one of those places because they were all such interesting stories of how the land played into that. Yeah, I, you know, I love, um, one, I love going and, and, and being in, in wild spaces. I feel very, um, free in, in those spaces. Um, but I also love learning about them and find that the more I learn, the more they, they sort of speak to me. And um, I don't know, I just feel like resonances and, and kinship with places. And so um, w one of the essays in this book is actually about being a backpacking guide in Yosemite. And I talk about... Um, you know, Yosemite is actually the name of um, that was given to the tribe that lived in the region by some of their enemies, and it means those who kill. Um, and they, they were actually the Awanichi, and so it's sort of a, a misnomer. Um, and at the time I was I was dealing with, I had I had kept my name from my first marriage, and I felt like, what do I do? Do I go back to my dad's name? I was engaged to be married. Do I take my new husband's name? Like I don't ha I don't have any good choice, right? And so this idea of naming was something that really resonated. Um, and so I, I find places, you know, speaking to me. Um, you mentioned Blackbird Knob Trail and Dali Sads, and um, again, because we're so close, Dali Sads, if you have not been, is about two hours north of here in West Virginia, and it is, it is just this amazing place with this incredible um, history. Uh, it's really a, a history of, of trauma um, where it was logged. I mean, there used to be spruce trees with nine-foot um, you know, diameter trunks, um, those were just taken. It was raised, the entire forest. And when that happened, um, the mantle of the forest floor dried out and there were lightning ignited fires and it just burned all the way to the rock. So it was just this kind of barren, um, like moonscape. And um, during the Great Depression, the CCC came in and they um, planted they planted trees. They attempted to do some restoration, but then during World War II, um, it became a, a place where they did um, missile and bomb testing, and and so they they actually still warn that like live bombs could they've they've scanned it, but people still occasionally find um, live munitions there um, that are left over from this place, and so you know it, it has had this like. <laughs> I mean, it's it's a place that has had trauma, um, but it is 
absolutely beautiful and there's this it's it's a tundra like landscape that they say is like similar to Canada and there are you know salamanders and all kinds of rare plants and it is it's just incredible and so to me that sort of speaks about resilience and you know what happens when you can no longer be what you once were when you have the things that define you taken away you become something else and that can also be a really a really beautiful thing and so um, for me places give me a way to uh, interpret my own experience and um, I guess, you know, ab absorb some of the wisdom of the world around me. Pilgrimage, you use that and you def we look at it a lot. And I, I just wonder how your travel in those same footsteps. Now, were they ancestors of you? No. Okay. Yeah. So following in that trek mm -hmm. and that pilgrimage, how, how did that affect you? Yeah, it's a, it's a question that comes up um, repeatedly through the book, this idea of pilgrimage and of the pilgrimage or the quest as a structure. Because on the one hand, there's something extremely attractive about that structure because it creates meaning. You, you, instead of just wandering around, you're actually going somewhere. And there are many ways that people use that, you know, metaphorically to think about their lives. It's very common to talk about life as a journey or as being on some kind of journey. And if that journey is a pilgrimage, then it, it's not random. And that can be quite comforting. However, it can also be experienced, and I have the kind of sort of personality that, that does tend to experience that as actually confining. Like I, I you know, you, you, you have a structure, then it starts to feel to me like everything is planned. And like now it's a track that I'm, that I'm stuck on and I have to go this one way and I want to go off the path and wander. And there's a tension throughout the book, um, which actually made the book itself a big challenge to structure as a writer. Like how do I put all this material together, all this very diverse material and different stories that are in the book? Um, how do you... Um, there, there was actually when we were traveling through the desert in Uzbekistan, one of our one of the leaders of our group um, was an Uzbek scholar, and he said at one point we were going through the desert and we're going on this road, and he was talking about the problem of roads in the desert um, because the desert, he said, is a body and it's alive and it moves. And so how do you how do you have a road so that you can get somewhere you don't get lost and die in the desert, which is a definite danger? How do you do that and still kind of preserve the possibility of the land itself moving? Um, and that to me is very, I mean, it became a way for me at sort of thinking about the structure of the book as well and of any storytelling project um, where there's that tension between how much structure is too much? How much how much structure do you need in order to even have it be a narrative? But then at what point does that narrative start to become something that is in charge of you? Um, and that's very true with the kind of narratives I'm talking about in the book, which are very often narratives of identity, of group identity, narratives about race, stories we tell ourselves about who we are. You know, at what point does that structure become um, become something that is no longer serving us because we can't get out? So, yeah, there are a lot of questions about 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 structure and movement, trajectory, and and veering off the trajectory. Where is the path, and then how can we get off the path? <laughs> yeah. Did you find yourself off the path at a certain point? I think, um, well, one of the things about this pilgrimage, if we call it that, is that, like, I mean, I became, I was very, um, I was, I was very fascinated by a photograph that I found of the church in this village, and the village is called Okmechet, which means the White Mosque. And there are different stories about that origin, but as you mentioned, uh, the first story I heard was that to the local population, which was largely Muslim, the whitewashed church in the middle of this Mennonite village was the White Mosque. 
Um, and I saw this photograph, which was taken in 1932, and I was like, I have to go there. I need to, I need to go inside like the church that was a mosque. This was a very like powerful thing. But that church no longer exists. I mean, the building is crumbled. The, there's, there's very little left in that village. And so there's also, you know, that's also kind of a, um, a question like you're going on this pilgrimage, but you already know that the thing is not there anymore. Um, and so then it does become a pilgrimage in the expectation of, OK, well, we know we're not going to see that, but what are we going to see? Uh, and so it it's yeah, it it certainly was a trip that was yeah, it was it was full of experiences that were meaningful, but not expected. Not such a straight line, it sounds yeah. like. Yeah. <laughs> there were dots all over at some yeah. point that you would have dissolving. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another theme, and I, oh, we need to get two questions. Um, it's already a half an hour. I knew we would be, and I've left some of these really good question morsels out there for you all because she's dropped these nuggets about this journey and, and where they've traveled. So if anyone has that, or we'll get to reading. We can start a reading while you're thinking of your questions. What do you think? Yeah? OK. Um, well, I mentioned um, Yosemite briefly. And I'm just going to read the opening of um, the second essay in, this, in the book, which is called On Naming Women and Mountains. I have known these mountains before, worn the dust of these trails, sipped from these streams. A few days shy of my 21st birthday, I slept beside my first love in the fragrance of these evergreens. I lay next to him four years later, a wife failing in love, and watched the Milky Way bridge these jagged peaks. Five years have passed since then, and I have returned, now alone, to spend the summer in Yosemite National Park as a backpacking guide. Here. Memories make me feel like a stranger to myself. My own name scratches and constricts like an ill-fitting sweater. It comforts me to be with wild things that do not speak it. As I walk among Stellar's Jays and Brewer's Lupin and Douglas Firs, I think, you too wear someone else's name. This is also true of mountains, valleys, rivers, and lakes, names within names. I wonder about the people and the motivations behind these names, which I feel hesitant to say aloud. A few days after my arrival in the park, I discover my favorite Yosemite waterfall two miles east of the backpackers camp at Little Yosemite Valley. There, Sierra Snowmelt races down a 100-foot granite slide, an uninterrupted ribbon of white water dissolving into a broad, round pool. This basin, when viewed from above, conjures a human iris. Golden green rings the shallows, deepening into jade at the center. And stones beneath the surface reflect the sunlight in varying hues. Wandering through a flat stretch of cedars, pines, and fir after my early morning ascent of Half Dome, I enter a canyon between the soaring walls of Moraine Dome and Bunnell Point where the Merced River spills out of the mouth of Lost Valley. I approximate my location on my topographical map and misidentify the falls as Bunnell Cascade. Lafayette Houghton Bunnell was many things, career soldier, surgeon, explorer, writer, historian. But foremost in my mind, he was a bestower of names. In March of 1851, at the age of 26, he and 57 other militiamen of the Mariposa Battalion became the first whites to enter Yosemite Valley. Their commission? To capture the Yosemite tribe of the central Sierra Nevada, responsible for recent raids on mining settlements, and forcibly relocate its members to a reservation in the San Joaquin Valley. And what to do with the newly appropriated land? with its glacial valleys, imposing rock faces, plunging waterfalls, and granite domes. As Steinbeck writes of California's early settlers and east of Eden, they had to give everything they saw a name. This is the first duty of any explorer, a duty 
and a privilege. You must first name a thing before you can note it on your hand-drawn map. Oh, yes, it is. OK. That was wonderful. Thank you, Lucy. Um, OK, so um, I'm going to read, maybe I'll read the, the opening section, which is very brief, and then a piece of another section. Um, so the opening is um, from the first chapter, which is called Tashkent. So we have just landed. We're in Tashkent. And this first little section is called Begin with the Glow. Begin with the glow, the faint beam of a half-forgotten history. In this darkened hotel room, a trace of ochre outlines the curtains. Push them aside, and a fawn-colored radiance blooms against my arms, revealing the city below, the dust and juniper trees, the loops of traffic. The light seems to flow from the streets as much as the sky a tint in the air, less a brightness than a universal softening of the atmosphere. It appears to have no single source. It arrives everywhere at once, from all the ends of the earth, from the future and the past. Rumpled sheets, silky patterned walls, a decorative chair in the corner, rigid and remote like a lady in waiting. I've traveled before as a tourist, a student, a volunteer English teacher, but never for research, never as a pilgrim. Outside, a bus called Golden Dragon, tree trunks painted white, the heat of June, and the vastness of Tashkent, its miles of tended parks, the giant mosques, that seem akin to the lonely Soviet structures, buildings marooned in the sky, much taller than the trees. The larger everything is, the smaller I feel, the more I sense the glow. My insignificance brings me close to stray, discarded things, to the story that brought me here, to this blade of grass I pluck by the statue of Amir Timur, the conqueror, guarded by angels, born with his fists full of blood. So that's the opening. That's how it opens. And then, thank you. And then I want to read just a little bit from um, the section called Wanderers, where we get to hear about these people who made this trip. Um, so I'll read a little bit of that. Um, and the section is called, what the, six, the section is, larger section is called Shadows of Earthly Things. Wanderers, they left their farms in Russia, the Amtracht settlement, the villages nestling in the valleys, the bubbling creek Tarlik. In his memoir of the trek, Franz Bartsch records the death of his infant daughter who succumbed to a sudden fever on the eve of the migration. Then we went to the cemetery where we took leave of our little one. They buried her at dawn on a summer day in 1880. By 10 o'clock, Barch and his wife were on their way to Central Asia with a group that would become known as the Bride Community. They were sojourners and pilgrims. They were Germans from the Volga, they would explain to people they met along the way who were seeking a place where they could practice their faith. They were leaving Russia, for the Tsar had revoked the law that exempted them from military service. All over the Mennonite settlements there, people were selling their farms and moving away, most going west to the Americas. But these, raising the dust with their line of 18 covered wagons, had chosen a different path, a more dazzling vision. It was a vision of the end of the world. For decades, millenarian fever had been rippling across Europe, intensified by a series of populist revolutions that were seen by some as the footprints of Antichrist. 
One of these prophets was the Mennonite preacher, Klaus Epp, Jr. He urged the faithful to abandon the West with its sick, collapsing empires and take refuge in the free wilderness of the East, in the desert, like the woman clothed with the sun in the book of Revelation. The moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. There they would await the second coming. Through his study of Revelation and the book of Daniel, Epp predicted Christ's return with increasing precision until he reached a date, March 8, 1889. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. You can see there's a lot of depth to these stories. It's not just your story, but it's stories of the land and stories of, of a pilgrimage and a history un unveiled. Do we have any questions? The question is, when you traveled to Uzbekistan, how did you transcend the language barrier? Yeah, great, thank you. Um, so this was a tour. It was actually a, a Mennonite heritage tour of, uh, of Uzbekistan. And so it was very well organized. And with us were um, a couple of leaders who were, um, there was an American historian who was leading us on the trip, but there, was all, there were also Uzbek guides. There were three of them who were with us, who were you know, fluent in English. Um, one was a professional tour guide, one was a tour guide in training, and the third was the PhD student um, historian um, that I mentioned earlier, all of whom were Uzbek, so they spoke Uzbek, they spoke Russian, um, possibly other languages, and were fantastic. Um, interpreters for us on the trip. You have a great story of Langston Hughes befriending someone and they never shared a, 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 a That's word. That's true. They got by without knowing the same language. Yeah. Question is about those, those Mennonites who stayed there 50 years. What happened to them and why did they move on? Yeah, they were deported uh, in 1935 by the new Bolshevik um, government. Um, and there's a kind of irony to it because they were they were deported for refusing to collectivize, um, but like they were very much living a, in a collective life. Like everything they did was a collective, but they would not they were not collectivizing with the state. They didn't want to give up their school. They had their own school. They school was taught in German, um, and they refused to give those things up. And so um, they were deported. And there's a, there was a very, yeah, there was a striking um, story. One of the stories that I, I tell um, is about how the, uh, in the beginning, the authorities were going to deport um, the families of 10 leaders. And those leaders were going to be executed. They were going to be shot. And when the authorities came to the village to get, to get the 10 families of these people, um, the women and children of the village all ran out and they were saying all or none, all or none, take all of us or none. And they, they climbed on their tanks, they lay down under the wheels of the trucks and the soldiers who had come to arrest these people sort of threw up their hands, they left their vehicles there because they were the women and children were climbing all over these vehicles and they left. Uh, and then the order came back and said um, all or none it shall be. Like, because you resisted the arrest of these 10 families, now all of you um, will be deported. And so, and, and the research on where they went is ongoing, um, but it is known that uh, a, a number of the group, probably the majority, were sent to a very barren um, part of, um, of Tajikistan. And they were dumped there with no, um, they didn't have, each person could take one bag um, of belongings. And they were sort of expected to starve there, um, but they they didn't have any animals, they didn't have any livestock. But they um, they yoked them. They took it in turns to yoke themselves to the plow, and um, and they plowed and they dug, um, made sod houses, and they survived. And eventually, um, you know, in the 80s, people with um, with German heritage or background were, were, many of them were invited to come to Germany. So the descendants of those people, many of them are now in Germany. 
The question is, who were the we that you traveled with? Were family members with you? Yeah, the we were um, other interested people who were taking this Mennonite heritage tour. And most of them were descendants of the, um, of the people who had been on this journey. Uh, so it was very moving to be there with them as they you know, were seeing places where their ancestors had lived and meeting descendants of people who had given hospitality to their ancestors. And like these people wouldn't exist, right, if not for these, the, these people who had sheltered them and given them places to stay, especially in the winter, and led them through the desert. So that was very powerful. That was most of the group. And then there were other people who were just you know, curious, like there was somebody um, who was um, not Mennonite, but she was part of a society of, of um, people of German heritage in Canada, and she was just like, oh, this looks interesting, so she came, you know. <laughs> yeah, but they were mostly descendants. The question being, did you revise the pieces since they were separate, and in the process of that, how was that to revisit those things that had happened in the past? Thank you. Um, so I did a lot of revision in the process of originally writing these, um, so they, they, they don't come out in this form. Um, but when I gathered them together in the book, they largely remained what, um, and many had been previously published individually in different literary journals. So they, they largely remained as I had written them. Um, there were a few small changes that I made. One of the changes, um, the opening essay of this um, is um, written in um, second person. It's epistolary. Um, and I, um, t to my ex, um, and the the closing essay um, is about uh, welcoming my, my son into the world. Um, and I chose to change it and, and put it in second person and make it sort of addressed to my son because um, I thought that was a nice way to sort of mirror that. So that is one of the, the changes that I made. Um, but I didn't, I didn't make a lot of huge changes when I brought it together as a collection. Um, I will say, though, you know, w what I think was most interesting was I recorded the audio book um, this year, and so I read all of these aloud from, from start to finish, and um, it was a moving experience to, um, you know, see... I guess, you know, where I had been to feel, you know, it brought back many of the emotions of some, some difficult times, but I also feel um, very proud of, you know, choices I made in those difficult times and ways that I, um, you know, went out into the world and things that I learned. And, um, and so it was definitely meaningful to revisit that, um, and a lot of the things I said, you know, still ring true, and I still feel very much in between places. So it's not like there's like a resolution or like closure. You know, my my mom keeps joking, "You're in between places." I'm like, "Yes, I am." Um, but um, but yeah, thank you for that question. That's wild because. I just finished the edits on the audiobook of this thing yesterday, and I'd never done it before, but I also had to read the whole thing aloud. It's, that's quite the experience. We should talk about that. <laughs> Question is about her vulnerability and really putting it out there um, and how, how hard it was, really, to put it out to family and friends and brave. Yeah, it's a strange experience, um, you know, being like, okay, my my colleagues and students and people I can go to church with and my mom can like read about my messy divorce or, you know, my husband jokes that it's like, how many times did you mention making love to your ex-husband versus me, you know? Um, and, um, you know, so there is a lot of really personal, you know, detail and it, it does feel vulnerable. I think what helps is that um, the responses to the book have been so warm and positive. And actually, Sophia and I were talking about this a little bit beforehand. Um, you know, people reach out, and one thing I've learned is you just you never know what's going on in someone's life under the surface. You don't know what's going on in their marriage, in their faith, um, the, the questions they're asking, the things they're struggling with. And um, I think most people, you know, they, they do have 
big questions and tensions. And so um, a lot of people have responded by saying, wow, like you, you found words for something that I'm experiencing, but I didn't know how to articulate. Or I also, you know, went through something like this. Thank you so much for writing about it. And I, it's been something that I feel not at all alone um, because I wrote about it and put it out there and so many people have responded. Um, and that's been, uh, I think, reassuring and helped me feel a, a deeper sense of community. So thank you for that question. The question is about thank you, is a thank you first, and then research, and where the research came in, the beginning, the middle, rabbit holes for research. <laughs> yes. Whichever one of you wants to answer that. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, this was, so this book took um, seven years to write, which is actually good for me because my average is nine. So, um, but it 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 was a ton of research. One of the things that I, uh, um, an experience that I had had before writing this book that I was very grateful for was that I did write a dissertation um, on Arabic literature when I was in order to complete my degree in graduate school, and I saw um, people who got stuck in the research and people who were there, and in fact, because I did my master's degree and then I left and had a 12-year career teaching English um, in Sudan, South Sudan and Egypt, and then I came back to the same PhD program and there was a dude who was still there <laughs> that had been there 12 years before, and I was like, I cannot be that guy. I have children, I have, like, a, no, and so, I, and so I had a very serious, and my students, I tell this to my students all the time, it was one page a day. You, we write one, any literate person can write one page a day. You text one page a day, right? So that was my schedule. I was like, I'm gonna write one page a day and I'm gonna do this dissertation in a year. And so that experience served me well because the research was fascinating and full of rabbit holes and I might still be down there if I hadn't, you know, had this in my mind that you can't let the research eat you alive. You have to do the two in tandem. You're doing research, yes, but you're not gonna do all the research before you start writing the book. You have to also be writing alongside, and then you do more more research, but be writing and let it grow organically together, um, and that way, you know, you always have a piece of writing that's evolving even though you're doing this research. I don't know how how it was for you. Yeah, I mean, I think the nature of my book's a little different than yours, and so um, it, it it has a lot of research. It's maybe not quite as research heavy. You know, I'm I'm a little bit of a nerd, and so I like like learning the names of trees and flowers, and um, you know, the rocks and the the history of the places I, I I go to. And so some of that just happens. Like I'm curious, like oh, I'm going to this place. I'm going to look this up, or hey, I'm going to be trying to learn my East Coast wildflowers, right? And so that's that's just kind of happening in in the background before I would go to a place. Um, there's also research that happens afterwards you know as I'm writing like I I take a lot of pictures too and so I'm like I want to name that thing I don't know what it was I got to figure out what it is you know and and I look it up but interestingly research has also like like some of the stories in this like emerged out of out of the research so that the the on naming women in mountains that I read a part of I um when I was a backpacking guide I was like oh I should be able to like tell people about the place names. I, so I bought a, hist uh, a, a book about the history of Yosemite place names, and I started reading it, and I started going like, oh man, oh, this is bad. Like, <laughs> you know, there's some like really awful things that happened here, and you know, I'm kind of disturbed by the way a lot of these names came about. And then I, you know, and I was wrestling with what to do with my own name, and just, you know, doing the research actually was something that like, that essay sprung out of, um, I, I didn't even know I was going to be writing it when I started that research. And so um, it comes in at different points, but it, it is easy to go down the rabbit hole. I sometimes just let myself do it for fun. <laughs> so the question goes to about eight tenths, I think you're right. It gets into the child that shows up, and it's a different voice, and, and really what, what happened there? 
Yeah, that was, thank you so much. That was, um, it was one of my favorite parts of the book to write. It is a, it is a memoir of um, me in high school. It is based on my high school journals, which I found and hadn't looked at in many years. And so it was very informative. Um, and there, there was a lot of stuff that I had forgotten. Um, but I think part of the reason, one of the reasons it was my, it, it was my favorite was because it was such a switch from the very research heavy, you know, where I'm constantly fact checking and all of a sudden it was like memory and it was like, it was just flowing. I wasn't stopping to look and check and make sure that things were correct. And I really um, just kind of got into the memories of being a young person, um, a young person of color at um, a Mennonite high school, which was a kind of distinctive um, experience and one that I, one that I had so little, I mean, I was just very clueless about at the time. And part of the pleasure of writing that was actually to return to that space of a cluelessness, of just not, of just not knowing, just like not getting it. Um, and, and a space in which I didn't have all the apparatus of like cultural criticism that I have now. Um, and um, and and so because it really was a, a person that I am not anymore, that's why you know the book has been in first person and it's I and I'm going to these places and learning these things and then suddenly it's in third person and it's about the child and it's this unnamed you know it's just the child who goes through these experiences and it felt like you know the right way to tell that story, which really at this point is a story about someone else. Yeah. Great question. We are out of time, but I just want to ask for any final words from both of you as to what you want to leave the audience with. Just want to thank you all for being here. And Sophia, it's been lovely hearing from you too. And I will just echo that anyone who's in between places, that middle is not a void. And I hope you learn to love it the way I have. I love that. That is the perfect word to end on. And I'm just going to echo um, many thanks to Lucy. Thank you to the audience. Thank you to Mary Catherine for the great questions. And thank you to Books and Bruce. All right. Can't say it better.